forts, gold, and an empire. If you have watched my documentary about Mithridates the Great, then you may know about Lucullus's campaign into Pontus during the Third Mithridates War. During this campaign, Lucullus had to besiege and take a lot of forts, and in this video, I will be talking about Mithridates' forts and his vast hordes of gold. Mithridates had built a total of 75 forts. That's more than one castle a year. In each and every one of these castles were hidden cisterns, weapon caches, trap doors, and stone steps to underground treasuries. In these vaults were stacked bronze, bronze caskets bound with iron, filled with gold and silver, which will be highly strategic in the campaigns that would come. These castles sh show just how obsessed with protection Mithridates was, but it also shows his genius. He built these castles knowing that the Romans would eventually, if they got past his Asian holdings further west, get into Pontus. So instead of waiting, Mithridates got to work constructing these castles. These, this was really expensive. So where did all the gold come from? This has puzzled me and it definitely puzzled Ro the Romans, just as it nags at historians. We can look north and northeast and northwest, and these foreign lands that Mithridates had conquered had only been taxed mediocrely. The reason for this was because he wanted the people to be happy, unlike the Roman subjects. The Scythians, of all these tribes, were the most important. Why? Archaeology shows us that the Scythians had a lot of gold, fe gold fields, and they also looted Kurgans, which is like a grave mound with gold in it. Now let's say the Scythians, who paid tribute to Mithridates, sent a casket of gold as tribute. Now Mithridates immediately puts the gold into one of his castles. Boom! Now all he has to do is fill it with weapons and troops. Now let's look east to the rich lands of India and China. Mithridates would have traded with these people. We know he also had troops from them. At the Battle of Chaeronea, Mithridates' generals had deployed some camels from Bactria. Why am I bringing this up? Well, if he had troops from these far distant lands, why wouldn't he trade with them? Another form of wealth would have come from the silk trade route, thus bringing in more. Mithridates' genius shows again. As the caravans passed through some of his lands, they would be taxed once again, though, only mediocrely. Once again, this would encourage more people to come through his lands, and it would also bring more money. Now just what would come through these trade routes? This is what would have been throwing it, flowing into the kingdom of Pontus. Grain, wine, salt fish, olive oil, honey, wax, gold, iron, minerals, dyes, and pigments, leather, furs, wool, linen, and many other goods. As you can see, Mithridates was very smart, and he used this to bring in all of his vast wealth. So with all this trade and tribute, King Mithridates becomes rich, with an unlimited wealth. Now he orders his castles to be constructed. The amount of years that it took to build these are questionable at best, but the whole project could have lasted a swathing 42 years. Just imagine up to 42 years of constant fort building. Where were these castles built? Once again, this is another debatable question. But we know that they were basically all around the Black Sea. He planted these castles within his subjects to make sure they were loyal, and they would stay loyal. But most of these castles were in the lands of Pontus, Armenia Minor, Colchis, and Kybera. These forts were positioned in the best possible places. Kybera, one of the fortresses, was placed on the Lycus River and almost impenetrable. Themyscira, another castle, was to the east of Amisis, and again, it was greatly defended and placed along the Black Sea, making it an important fortress. Pharnakia and Trapezos were two other castles which lay along the Black Sea coast. Canon Corion, which meant New Castle, was Mithridates' favorite castle. It was positioned on top of a mountain, 
Not only was it extreme well, extremely well defended, it also held his important papers. These papers were the same papers that held his antidote. Sadly, they have been lost to us. Now, just how did these castles hold out so long and fiercely against Lucullus? Well, within the forest of Kybera, there were there was a huge abundance of food. Gazelles roamed the fields. There were grain fields and grapes, pears and apples and nuts in such abundance that one could gather food for a whole year. Another source of food and water was the vast amount of rivers and streams in Pontus. These are the names of just a few. Amnias, where the first battle of the Mithridatic Wars was won. The Halus River, where another battle was won. This was during the second Mithridatic War. The Temdon, Temodon River, which flowed into the Black Sea. The Iris River, another that flowed into the Black Sea. The Lycos River, which ran all the way from Amatia to Satala. The Lake Stephane, which is where Mithridates' mother built her castle, Laodicea and the Euphrates River. If used right, water and food can be stored in one of these castles enough to last at least a few months. On the Iris River, the castle of Amatia was one of the strongest castles in Pontus, with a large reservoir on top of a mountain looking over the Iris River. Stuff like this have been, must have been insanity to fight. Let's try and piece together what a campaign in Pontus would have been like. Upon entering Pontus from the west, you will be greeted with immense wealth and abundance of animals and food. Continuing on, you will clash in the middle of Pontus. You send multiple legions to besiege the grand castles of Pontus. First, Amysis, Sinope, and Themyscira. However, what you encounter is not what you expect. At Amysis, the garrison proves their worth. Every day they sally out and attack your camp and challenge your warriors in one-on-one -on -one combat as if they were reenacting the glorious duels of Homer's champions on the field of Troy. At Themyscira, famous for their Amazon warriors, is unbearable. As your soldiers dig tunnels, all of a sudden the garrison charges. Swords and spears clash in the mines. However, you are not ready for their next move. As fighting rages, they unleash swarms of stinging wasps. Then, as you flail at the wasp, your enemy unleashes weasels, foxes, wolves, boars, and bears into the tunnel. You think I'm lying? Well, guess what? I'm not. This is exactly what it would have been like, and exactly what Lucullus was put through. And as all these sieges went on, Mithridates was supplying the defenders. Just imagine being in that position, always being put through hell. And if the castles aren't taken by force, then you will probably sit and siege it for at least an, a year. Now, let's look into Arminia Minor. I only mentioned it, mentioned it before briefly, but it's more important than you think. Well, why am I not mention, mentioning any castles? That's because they are all hidden. To this day, 2,000 years later, we still have not found the castles within Armenia Minor. When Tigranes the Great, King of Kings, gave Mithridates Armenia Minor, he wasn't thinking like Mithridates was. Mithridates saw this as a beautiful and extremely mountainous and defensible region. Funny thing about Armenia Minor is that Lucullus never really looked there. He was too busy trying to fight and loot Pontus. So, while all this fighting and looting was going on, Mithridates' castles in, in Armenia Minor were shipping out money, troops, and equipment. Amazing to think about this. And now we know just why and how Mithridates bounced back after seemingly massive and terrible losses. Yes, he might have lost, but he always had a backup plan. I hope this paints a good enough picture for you. I really enjoyed making this, and thank you all for watching. Goodbye.